Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly webinar on the Transparency and Consent Framework. Um, we're joined today by Alan Frankenberg Schroeder from Smato, um, Mike O'Neill from uh, sorry, I just got distracted. Um, Mike O'Neill from Baycloud and Blake Brandon, Casey Hill, and um, Simon from OneTrust. And Baycloud and OneTrust will be showing off their CMP tools. And Alan Frankenberg Schroeder is going to give a bit of an update about the mobile in-app specifications. To start with today, I'm going to do a little bit of self-promotion for ID Europe. We have a conference next week, or it's actually our flagship conference um, in Milan called Interact. And this year, since it happens right before the GDPR comes into force, we have quite a heavy focus on GDPR and data protection law, um, starting with a uh, panel on the main stage on the first day um, that includes uh, people that you see on your screen. So um, the colleagues uh, from OneTrust will know Kabir, he's their CEO. Uh, we have Alice Lincoln, uh, VP for Data Privacy and Governance for Media Math, and Summer Simpson, who's the head of product management at Comcast and has done quite a few of these webinars too. Unfortunately, I think Julia Schulman is unable to make it, um, and the session will be moderated by our CEO, Tamsin Thien. Over the two days, we have several items. Um, so some trainings that I will be doing myself. Um, there will be the panel, as I said. We're doing a live stream Q&A with the head of the European Data Protection Supervisor. And we have a fireside chat with an MEP who's been working on the e-privacy regulation. You um, will be able to ask questions by typing them in the questions pane. I just want to give you a disclaimer today that we have quite a packed agenda. So there is a chance that we will not be able to get to the question and answer session if the presentations run a bit longer than expected. Um, if we do, I will do my best to prioritize questions to the um, presenters from Baycloud and OneTrust um, and Smato, um, rather than focus on questions about the transparency and, framework, uh, transparency and consent framework in general. That's because there's a lot of basic information out there, uh, and we want to give as much time to our specialist speakers. Um, so speaking of which, I want to hand over now to Alan Blankenberg Schroeder, who's come here from Smato. He's been working on the mobile in-app specifications together with the IB Tech Lab working groups. And I'm just going to hand you presenter now and uh, take it away. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. And um, thanks for the opportunity to, to present here. I hope everybody can now see my screen. Looks like it. Yeah. Um, it. Yeah. So um, we, as Smato, were heavily involved in the uh, mobile in-app specification. So the main specification of the transparency and consent framework was already in place. While well, moving, moving target, as we all know, as GDPR is a moving target. But there was already a big portion of the transparency and con content framework done. And uh, we then chimed in to make this happen in mobile in-app world uh, where our main playground is. Um, I will briefly go over the actual transparency and content framework, which is the basis um, of everything. So we need some basics here, uh, but there are specialized webinars on this, so I think I will keep it very, very short. And then I will go into the actual technical specs and depth of um, the mobile version. So I guess most of you have seen these slides. It's, uh, I think, three slides that are actually from the IAB. So um, the core of everything is the global vendor list. So everybody, anybody who wants content, needs content, so any data controller, needs to register at this global vendor list. And then he is listed to get content. Of course, that is then afterwards still the choice of a publisher if somebody is actually listed. But this is the core that needs to be there. Also part of this list is a list of purposes. So for what actually a content is asked for. Um, the three main ones are the first three. <laughs> Um, it's accessing a device 
identifier. It is personalization or building a profile and then targeted advertisement. There's also uh, measurements and the fifth one. And there's also an option to come up with custom ones that a publisher can define or a CMP can define. Um, any company that registers here is, if you take a look at the upper right, it's also listing which purposes it's actually asking content for. So it then gets listed for, for example, for targeted advertisement. So now we have a list that everybody knows what they want to ask content for. Um, next thing is, if you have actually content, you then need to, to transfer it from a user somehow through the ecosystem to everybody who needs the content. So as we know, mobile web, uh, normal web, everything, uh, we want to have everything as dense as possible to not have any uh, additional latencies, etc. So we need needed to come up with a very dense format. And um, that is the cookie format. Well, cookie, what it was originally called, it's content string format. And the two core format parts are the purpose choices and the vendor choices of the user. So a user can say yes to certain choices, to, to certain purposes, and to certain vendors. And you see then here, um, abbreviated actually, he shows yes on all the five purposes. And then per vendor, for example, exchange one is a yes, exchange two is a no, exchange three is a yes. And there's mirrors here, if you go from left to right, SSP1, SSP2, exchange one, exchange oops, two here is the, the zero, and then exchange three. So now we have a way to transport everything from left to right, from a user to everybody downstream. Now this is looking uh, how it looks like in an exact example. So the publisher in the beginning with the user, Ask for content, gets the answer. It is encrypted. Well, encrypted is wrong. Um, it is um, compressed in this content payload format. And then, in this case here, trans transferred to SSP1 and 2. It's then transferred from SSP1 to Exchange1, both having content, and they can choose to do the exact one uh, purposes, etc., processing as they need. In SSP2 case, you actually see the exchange three is green lighted because the content was given. Exchange two is not. So he doesn't have that content. So you actually have a full transparency throughout the whole ecosystem chain. And well, there's a web. Reference implementation, this is an example that uh, looks very much like the IB um, reference implementation. This is actually Quantcast one. So you have a front screen, you have then on the right, the actual option to go deeper. So do you see the actual purposes? Uh, here you see accessing a device, advertising personalization, analytics, content personalization. And if you are interested in actually selecting and seeing each uh, vendor, you're able to see the full vendor list and as a user are able to select and deselect certain vendors. There's additional, additional functionality that is currently also in work. For example, um, whitelist from a publisher, uh, something that is already there is um, pre-filters from, from a publisher that can be directly um, be part of before listing this list. And this is basically how it works in web. Now, the big question is, of course, how can we make that happen in app? And in app, while it sounds pretty similar, is a slightly different beast. From the look and feel, it can actually look pretty similar. So you have the same choices, you have the same subcategories, you have the same list, basically. Of vendors, but 
uh, we don't have one web page where everybody can communicate. So uh, the main reference implementation actually is based on JavaScript and being on the same web page. So we needed to take a look at the actual use cases that were already implemented, but we needed to transfer in a slightly different way, of course, into in-app. So first, at some point, you need to get content. So a publisher realizes, I wanna get content right now. And that doesn't need to be in the beginning, like starting an app, it doesn't need to be then because a publisher doesn't need to choose to show advertisement directly or to do some processing that requires certain content. So this is actually something that the publisher should trigger whenever he sees the need on that. Of course, if he triggers first an advertiser, then the advertiser might indirectly choose to trigger this. The second one is, of course, if a user gave content, he needs to be able to change his content. Then third, of course, we want to transfer the down, downstream to the SDKs, to everybody else. For that, we need to store it somewhere or hand it over somewhere. So, wait. Um, the, the CMP then has determined, or actually a publisher might have determined, that the user falls under GDPR. So fourth one is then the actual content given or not given, and we can reuse the full version of the web solution, which is completely transferable to a mobile of the content format, so we didn't need to change something there. And the fifth one is an SDK, a vendor like Smarto, like AppNexos, like Sysmic, like uh, analytics providers need to know if actually a CMP is available, if, if a user falls under GDPR, if they need to even think about consent or if they can assume, oh, I'm outside of anything GDPR relevant uh, case and I can just go on. And these are the two fields that are then the important one, is a CMP present and is this user subject to GDPR? And then a Smarto also needs to know is Smarto even allowed to, for example, access an advertiser ID? <clears throat> so we had actually several options on the table when we were implementing this and thinking about it. Um, we thought about actually having the full code with objects, et cetera, in there. Um, at some point, we realized it's very easy to have conflicts in code and um, libraries, and we need to go an easier route that has less conflict potential. And we went with ba basically an app storage approach. So the dark bluish names that you see here, IAB content subject to GDPR, IAB content content string, IAB parsed purpose content and vendor content are actually stored keys in either Android shared preferences or iOS and as user default. And if you now take a deeper look, technical look at this, CMP presence is just a Boolean information so that that any SDK then knows, oh, there is something um, I need to listen to further. Subject to GDPR is if a user is falling under this GDPR, which can be preset and overridden by a publisher, but otherwise also determined by a CMP. And then there's the original content string with everything all the information, each content that has been given, encoded. And the last two are really for, for example, for a smarter to know what may I do with this information? May I access now the advertiser ID or may I not? 
So the path purposes are a list, a string of ones and zeros. So technically, a smarter SDK or any other SDK can go now and say, I want to have purpose one. Is this set to one or is it set to zero? Also, smarter SDK can say, oh, I'm vendor number 82. So I can look it up in the string, am I currently listed there? So an SDK can easily look it up without heavy code, without any objects that need to be shared, any problems that might turn up because of this. So we now have a defined API. Um, I wanted to give some background about the actual CMP consent information that is then encoded in the actual consent string. So of course there's a version number, um, meaning if we ever upgrade to a newer version, then this will be increased. And of course the parsers need to be upgraded then in that case. And actually if you think about it, if a content management provider here in the middle actually writes down already the past purposes, then we can be backward compatible even if this format thing changes. So the advantage is here by having this pre parsed and stored. Of course, we might have really breaking changes, but smaller changes upgrading this we still can provide the original purposes, past purposes and past vendors. And it doesn't need to be, a, ooh, now every SDK needs to be upgraded. We might actually face new versions where we don't need to upgrade all the SDKs, making it easier for all the publishers. Then we have the information when the user actually consented. And most of this information here is for a paper trail so that we actually, everybody in the ecosystem knows when a consent was given, can prove it afterwards in case of a lawsuit or some, some regulators saying, oh, do you really have a consent? And actually the GDPR states that you need to track the actual consent given. So when was it original asked for or created? The first time the user gave consent. When was it last updated? And this is also important information when you consider when to ask the second time because you have bigger changes on your side, you just added new vendors, new purposes. The CMP ID, uh, every, every content manager should register the ID and then get the own ID. And then the version and content stream and language, these are then well, based on what the CMP is actually providing. But it gives the proof of the actual wording, how a user was asked at a certain time. Then there's a reference of the actual lend vendor list. So this vendor list is actually currently, I think, at number 20. It's getting uh, frequently upgraded. So I guess on Monday we have a number 21 adding new vendors all the time. And then we have the information of the actual purposes and vendors uh, where we have a consent or not. So this actually gives pretty much deeper background around this, what information is then transferred. And we actually build a reference, reference implementation, uh, which is currently, I think, still pending for upload, but uh, already available at the Smarto GitHub. Uh, it consists out of two different components. You A have the web implementation. So it's basically a copy from the IAB web reference, reference implementation, excuse my English. Um, we have a small adjustment for in-app so that we are actually able to, well, after the content has been given and created, we are able to communicate it back. And of course, back means the second part, that is the wrapper that is available for Android and for iOS. So it takes this information and then 
is able to store it in the before mentioned API. Keep in mind, this is still the reference implementation and we currently don't provide our own full CMP that you can just take and take ours. So Smarto is currently not a CMP. So if you consider building this your own, you need also to consider to register at the IB as a content uh, management provider. So main advantages of this approach are clear, I think, because we have a web-based approach, it's easily upgradable. Uh, you, you have one space where everything is stored, it's pre-parsed, every SDK can easily read it. Of course, the web-based solution has also a few downsides. If a user currently doesn't have an internet connection, then of course you can't ask for constant. And you need to keep that in mind if you're, when you're considering when to ask actually for content. So that comes down already to when to actually trigger the content question. And there's, well, the upper part here that I'm listing here is basically from the IAB transparency and content framework, the policy. More specific, I'm interested because it's in ad in the lower part and I just wanna go to that detail. Um, as I said, of course, online communication need to be available to actually ask for content if you go for a web-based or partially web-based solution. You can also do country-specific deployments in app stores. So you can assume if you have all EE countries, EEA countries, European Economic Area countries, and have one version that you deploy to just these countries, this is a very, very, very good approximation if the user falls under GDPR or not. And of course, the IAB consent framework has also support for these custom uh, purposes. And you can actually use these custom purposes to ask for third parties that are not currently listed in the global vendor format, but you need due to certain reasons also on your list or you have a special purpose on your own. This is everything from my side. Uh, thank you very much. I guess uh, some questions maybe at the end. Um, so I'm, I hand over now to Mike O'Neill, I think. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, Alan. I'm just gonna break with tradition, ask you very quickly one question that came in. Um, how can people get access to the reference implementation um, on Smarter's GitHub? Is that publicly available to people or um, well, this is not supposed to be transparent. Um, yes, it's publicly yeah. available on the GitHub of Smarto. Okay. Um, so GitHub, what is? So I've, I've I've just handed oh. um handed over oh, yeah. to Mike. I think Sorry. your camera's on though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So it's available on GitHub.com slash I think Smarto. Okay. Um, we are pending the upload. To the actual IB GitHub, um, so it should be available soonish there. Um, but right now, you can already access it from um, yeah the Smarto GitHub. Okay, great. I'll make sure to um, include those links in my follow-up email that I will send out on Monday, um, so you can find it there as well. Monday, uh, if not, you can go look for it yourself. Um, so that brings us to the first of our two CMP demos, and this is a demo um, by Mike O'Neill. Um, of BayCloud's consent management providing tool. Hi, Does any, can everybody see my screen? Is it visible? Yes. Okay, good. Um, well, well uh, I'm Mike O'Neill, um, and I am uh, one of the founders of uh, BayCloud Systems. And we started uh, back in uh, 2011 with our, with our product to, to meet the requirements of the e-privacy e directive. Uh, we became active in uh, in in Europe, uh, and um, basically I, the idea that was that we would give a tool that would allow websites to give effective user control to their website visitors, um, which was verifiable 
and transparent and actually uh, actually did something. So the idea would be that people would see that they had a a, uh, a tool that could they could give their consent or revoke revoking consent at any time, and they then would uh, as a result of that, and that uh, would actually work and stop tracking and all that stuff, and that would give them uh, increase their level of trust in that in that company. That was basically the idea, uh, which we and so we introduced that in uh, May 2011, and uh, now it's established on uh, thousands of sets. We've got versions in. Uh, of the of the tool in uh, in all, all European countries and other countries, but like most of South America, Turkey, Russia, and so on. Uh, this is our main website, our own website. And just to quickly show you how the, the basic idea is: we have this kind of button, which can um, which appears can appear anywhere on this page. It can be appear in the foot, it can appear in a specific place, or you can make it appear in, in the corner of the screen and so on. And it always shows whether the it always shows the user whether they've opted in or opted out, basically. Um, and this this we have different forms of it. This is a kind of a shield button. If it has a C in it, they've they've opted in. And 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 by clicking on it, clicking on the, the the shield button makes the panel appear, but where they can change their consent. And this is the one. This is the one we have on our own site. These panels are. Just the HTML files that any anybody we can, they can configure it themselves and put their own text in there and so on and so forth. Although we have a lot of infrastructure around our own particular ones, uh, and then you can look at particular um, you know, categories. This is the way it's set up the privacy directive where you have functional cookies and uh, sites and analytics cookies or storage advertising and so on. If you if you agree. To all of them, then uh, they get all flip over. And you've given your consent, and of course the C is um, appears in the screen and in the uh, shield button. And if you hover over it, it tells you that you're you're opted in. And if you opt out, um, it shows that you've opted out. Uh, I'll just show you on one of our uh, customer sites here. This is um, basically a form. So this is a different form of the panel, which comes down from the top. Um, you know, by default you're opted out uh, on all these sites. So if you, um, you know, if you click, basically you click the, the shield button, and the panel comes down, and you can either accept or, or decline. I'll just show, just to show you that we, we have this, uh, we have our own uh, browser extension that shows what you are going on. You could use Ghostry. Um, it's Ghostry shows shows us uh, because they're opted out. There's only what they call trackers, which is the the the, the kit, the um the font that's, uh, that's used on the site, and us because they uh, they see us as a tracker, which of course we're not. We've always been a, um, a not we're not part of the advertising system, and we basically only offer a consent tool. That's all we do. We don't collect personal data. But anyway, they got us down as tracker, which just shows us that we are here. Uh, if you look at our own um, <coughs> extension. It shows this shows all the all the third party domains, the first party domain and the third party domains. Uh, we are very transparent because we were heavily involved with the do not track protocol in the process. So we heavily pushed um, do not track as a way to do the of, um, of transparency and control. Uh, so we can show this is a bit similar to the uh, pub vendors JSON. This is what they call a tracking status resource, which shows various information about the this. In this case, this is the first party. That's uh, who the data controller is, what their privacy policy is, what domains they use, and various things like that. And um, you can also look at you know individual third parties can also offer a, a, a well-known resource which explains the same sort of tra transparency information. But I won't waste too much time on that. Um, but, but anyway, there's no tracking going on in there. There's, when, if there's any cookies, the third uh, UID cookies or whatever, we've got a big red thing there which there's not non-running. So you, if you want to ch change, you say accept. Um, and now, now you can see there's a C button, a C a here. So now you know that you're opted in, and it says there in German that you've that you've opted in, and you can always see it. It's always there. Um, and then you can uh, refresh the screen just to make sure. So now we, we because we've given consent, now cookies will appear. Um, so if I look at Ghost Tree. Again, now we see we've got, you know, a few trackers. We've got Google Analytics, New Relic, 
uh, and so on, uh, various other ones. Um, double click. Uh, if you look with Bouncer, our uh, extension, um, it shows <coughs> um, a bunch of these. I think there's the big red uh, dots to show that uh, there's a persistent UID cookie there. Uh, there's one there. Um, and uh, and also because we use the do, we use the do not track protocol, but we if, the, if it's supported by the browser, which it is in this case because we've got back, 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 back our bouncers installed, it also sends the DNT consent signal as well. Um, so that's what that's what that does. Right, and then um, yeah, I'll just show in particular here's another situation. This is where there's a video. This is a, a YouTube video. Um, I'll just I'll just uh, opt out here um opt out. i'll just show because also when you opted out of course if you're opted out for any, any tab there's also there's the other tab i've got there's this tab it's also opted out um uh, it's just a reset there refresh right so we're so we're opted out um and then the tape and the shield comes up oh no this sorry do that again uh, Right, so we're opted out, and uh, it has to do a refresh because we've opted out. It has to clear cookies and so on. Right, so then it shows we're opted out. So we want to play, show this video. So if the guy clicks the video, um, a panel comes down, and then they can choose to either, and there's another, some other slightly different text where they, they can either click accept and play or, or decline. So if they click the decline, the thing goes away, and they're still opted out. Or they can hit, well, no, I've got to hit the wrong button there. If you click on the play button, it comes down, and then they can decide to do play it, so it's accepting play, and uh, the YouTube uh, video starts to play. Yeah, just, just make that start and just switch that off. Um, and uh, so I'm opted in. So now I'm opted in because I played the video, but I can always opt out at any time. So the idea really is that if you give people control, uh, they're much more likely to give their consent in the first place. This has always been our position. Here's, a, here's another, a different uh, site with a slightly different shield button. Uh, this, uh, um, you know, basically this is in Dutch. It's basically the same concept, except, and um, C comes up in there. Um, here's, this is another one uh, where you can play, play, accept and play, and the video will start to play. I won't waste too much time on that. Uh, so, on, in terms of uh, the what we've done for the uh, IAB consent daisy bit uh, consent uh, bit pattern, um, we have here's a, a this is a demonstration site. We have, we're not actually on the Guardian. This is a, a demo. We can we can put our stuff on any site in terms of our for doing demos and so on. Those are the other ones were actual live sites. This is this is a, one of our own. Um, so you, this has got also the chill button. Um, but we now got so we've got three buttons on the thing, which is accept all, decline all, or choose. Right, and choose is you can actually have granular control over the individual um, sort of third parties or purposes. Um, so you've got functional cookie as before. We've got the functional cookie. These categories can be are completely changeable. You can, you can categorize them in any way you like. But then we've got advertising as one overall category. And because we use, and this is now using the um, the vendor list, so it's picking up a subset of the vendor list. And you can look, and you can in, and you, you can individually opt out, or you can opt out of all of them by doing that. That will opt out of all the advertising ones. Or you can um, opt out into individual ones. Um, opt out of that one, and then you can oh you can you can go down and look at um, look at this one. You know, drill down to look at the information. There's this privacy policy. This, this is actually come from the vendor list. There's the privacy policy of this company, and there's we, there's a, we also have the domains in there that they they store all, all these domains for all that things. And then the purposes. Which comes from the vendor list, uh, and if you hover over the purpose, it comes up with a tooltip showing you more the uh, description of that purpose. So you can look at that, and it's got features, and so on. Anyway, so that's basically all that stuff as it is. Um, 
Uh, I mean, this is the same. If I, you know, once I can, I can, I can, you know, there I can accept all, or I can, um, you know, decline all, uh, and you know, that gives the, the absolute e the easiest way to interface with it. And that, you know, by default, they would be they would be opted out, and. Um, uh, this is so <laughs> <laughs> trouble with the internet today anyway so, so just to show this is bouncer showing uh the um what's on the screen and uh it's basically the same thing there's no there's no tracking going on because we're opted out if i opt in um that's where everything i say accept all the c button comes up uh i think it automatically this one automatically does a refresh uh let's do one just in the same side and then um uh, And then, uh, let's go. So, right, and then this is a big site. And then you look and see that there's actually a whole bunch of um, tracking going on, double click, Google, and so on and so forth. Because you're up, but that's okay, because you're opted in. Anyway, so basically, our idea is you, the thing actually should work. It should stop tracking unless the user's given, given consent. And when, you, when they have given consent, we then in the case of the advertising, a company which is registered on the vendor list, we will send the, the consent, uh, the data bit cookie, or we, su we support it as a first party cookie, or or using it, we have an option for using the third party cookie if people want to do that. But, but our basic idea is, basically the idea is to push the idea of, of site specific consent. So the publisher as a first party cookie, they uh, establish consent with the user but it doesn't necessarily apply to another site that the user might go to. So we, so you can offer the user the ability to give consent on a site-specific basis, which I think is quite important, uh, and which, which is also the, the reason for the, the do not track um, site-specific consent protocol, um, which we still hope will, will actually become uh, implemented by major browsers. It only ever got implemented by Microsoft, but we're hoping that we will actually ultimately get implemented by the other browsers and it and i think it ties in quite nicely with the iab approach because it would it, it would allow you to trigger signal site specific consent in a very simple way and um, and give you a lot more uh, control over it which i can talk about sometime if anybody wants me to talk about it okay that's it i'm finished i'll just put i think we've got a thanks a lot mike i'll just put my oh. name up there and so oh yeah, yeah. Please do, <laughs> so people can uh, get in touch with you uh, if they have any specific questions. Um, so up next we have one trust. Um, I'm not sure which one of you, because it's three of you in, um, would like to have the presenter role. Uh, could you just speak up? Okay. Yeah, you can make Blake the presenter. Okay, sure. Uh, make presenter. All right. Um, Blake, Casey, and Sumant, you have control. Um, please take it away. Excellent. Well, great. Well, uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity to present today. Let me get my, my screen sharing and we will jump directly into this. All right, excellent. So just to quickly introduce myself, uh, the voice here on the phone, Blake Brannon. I actually run the product team uh, for OneTrust. And um, just to quickly kind of give you an overview of what we do, uh, OneTrust is a what we call kind of comprehensive privacy management software solution. Uh, so we do lots of things using a technology platform to help companies with managing their privacy uh, you know, program. And one of the aspects that we've been doing for the past few years has been around providing consent notices for capturing cookie consent uh, on websites and enabling you to track and integrate with that. And 
we've been working really close with what's been happening in the market and obviously the IAB uh, EU framework and are excited to showcase today uh, the integration that we have done with the tools and the uh, CMP that we provide to adhere to the IAB EU consent standards. Uh, so what our solution does, and I'll, I'll just demo this, but just to explain it, is we provide you a mechanism to put a very customizable and configurable notice on your website. Uh, underneath that notice is a way to trigger customizable consent um, you know, framework of, of what triggers a consent. So for example, you could uh, force the consent to be an explicit opt-in type of model versus an opt-out or an implied type of model. We then take that consent preference, uh, whether it's from a web or a mobile application, and we store that uh, within our system so you have a audit record of the consent transactions for the user. And then we can integrate that consent into, uh, of course, first party cookies, your tag manager tool that you might have on your website, but also most important and relevant for today's conversation, the IAB consent standards so that third party ad providers that you're putting on your website uh, can integrate and respect that user's consented preferences. So if they choose not to see personalized ads, then those uh, third party ad providers would adhere to that. Um, the tools used by uh, over 3,000 organizations, we're a company that is very invested in this market. So we have over 400 employees across five different offices. And this consent tool is deployable in over 35 different languages. Um, so let's jump straight to just looking at it and a product demonstration. So the first thing I want to demo to you is what the experience looks like for you to embed this onto your uh, website. Um, so the first thing you'll see here is <clears throat> when a visitor navigates to your website, you have a way to customize either a banner from the bottom, from the top, in the center of the page, doesn't really matter, uh, but you can educate them and inform them of any information about your, your use of ads, your use of tra tracking technologies, uh, and various things that you want to inform them with, and then customize the type of experience you want them to provide. So do I have an option to uh, get more information or do I just agree to all and consent to all? Um, our tool supports uh, you to have the ability to list out your privacy information about your website in our CMP. Um, you can categorize certain cookies uh, and preferences as being part of kind of legitimate interest uh, messaging and you can of course list that out here through the tool and be able to uh, navigate to uh, for example links to these different third parties that may have this type of cookie or uh, purpose that's on your site and then here you can see how I'm demoing and showing you a way to group categories of purpose and for each of these categories of purpose I'm listing the various uh, ad tech providers and enabling the user to have very granular control of maybe turning off specific providers or at a purpose level, the ability to uh, inactivate an entire purpose and then of course save those settings for the user and integrate it with the ad tech, uh, excuse me, the IBEU privacy standard. So that's one uh, kind of configuration mode that you can put the system in. Uh, similarly, just showing you a different design uh, here, the exact same site, I could configure rather than uh, showing a list of individual vendors and allowing the user to opt out at a vendor level, some publishers may choose to only uh, demonstrate or show this at a purpose level. Uh, so here you can see it's just a very configurable tool where in this case, I'm demoing that I can't actually opt out at a vendor level, but I'm choosing to only show uh, these at a purpose level. So either way, uh, both are supported by the OneTrust uh, CMP or consent management tool. And it's up for you as a customer to configure that. All of this is very easy to configure everything from what are the categories that I wanna show this information in? How does that map to the IAB standard categories for third-party ads that are coming to my site? And how do I wanna show vendors or even limit the specific type of vendors that I want to serve content on my site? Um, all of that is configured here in our administrative UI. So here you can see we have a new setting uh, for where you're defining your cookie policies. So for 
effectively your website consent. You would select things like a banner uh, layout option. So you could choose again, the style, the behavior, the experience that you want your users to see, uh, any custom CSS that you wanna include, any logos and colors, very easy to configure here. And then when you get to the cookie policy configurations or the consent policy configurations, here you can see I can enable turning on the IAB framework, and then I can choose to group these IAB standard controls into various categories that then uh, are exactly what you see here on the website. So for example, legitimate interest, information storage and access, that is a category that you can control and define here and then choose uh, which vendors or which uh, purposes as defined by the IAB map to that category. So let's let's look at what that looks like under the hood and, and maybe more applicable here for the audience. Um, so let me, uh, let me click and just say, I'm gonna allow all of these purposes. And then I'm going to uh, just show you on the, the site here, when if you were a ad tech provider, the JavaScript query that you would run to actually call and get the consent preferences for that user. So if I uh, actually execute that query here, if you remember, for example, the end user opted into all of the purposes. So if someone was to query that, you would see here for purpose one, two, three, uh, these are all set to true currently. Now, if I go as a user and uh, come back and I decide I wanna change my preferences and maybe I will opt out of two of these just for demonstration purposes, and I'm gonna say okay. And now when I, let me clear that so it's clean, load the preferences now from that JavaScript, uh, you can see here that categories one and two are indeed false. Uh, so this is effectively what third party uh, provider would be reading from our API that we've integrated onto the site uh, for you. So again, that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Again, all this is uh, very customizable. And uh, you know, as you can kind of see going through some of the screens uh, here, this is not just something that we do for the IAB standard uh, purposes and third party content, but also of course other first party cookies or even third party cookies that you wanna put on your website that you also need consent for uh, in a single CMP experience that your user sees as they navigate to your site. Uh, so I think I did uh, kind of the entire demo in about five minutes. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to uh, the team here and maybe we can jump into some Q&A from today's session. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, that was very quick, very um, insightful, and I think you covered everything. Um, but I don't know, <laughs> there's probably more you would have been able to say. Um, so hang on, I'm just trying to figure out which screen to show so I don't show anything I'm not supposed to. Um, hang on. I think you guys just see a generic screen now, which is fine with me as well. Um, so we have a, a few questions that came in. Um, for those of you unaware, there's a questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen uh, where you can fill in your questions. I will read them out to the panelists and um, they will answer uh, as best as they can. Um, so we actually have a question for each um, CMP. So that's a nice way to start. So there's a question for BayCloud um, from Roman Gauthier who asks, do you support HTTPS? And I think that's because um, your browser was showing not secure or something, but it might be because you were looking at demos, is that correct? Sorry, yeah, yeah sorry. I've been disabled HTML and SSL checking because, uh, because we're doing development from this machine, that's all, that's all. So yeah, yeah. there's obviously support HTTPS. <laughs> okay. Um, and then for uh, OneTrust, a question came in from Christoph Prager. Uh, how much does the OneTrust consent management tool cost? So our pricing is available on our website, OneTrust, O-N-E-T-R-U-S-T dot com slash pricing. And you, uh, you pay, you can see the information there, but you basically pay per domain. And for enterprise customers, we do have more advanced options that cover larger sets of domains. Okay, thanks. Um, so this question comes from Ken Dreifach, and it's it's um, actually addressed to both of uh, both OneTrust and BayCloud, um, and maybe Smato could weigh in as well. Um, can the providers uh, say a word or two about how withdrawal of consent, i.e., opt-out options, are provided? For example, how ubiquitous or conspicuous 
are they given on a uh, given website? So, um, would you like yeah, to take so that first? <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, basically, we've always had this continuous revocability has always been a big thing for us. So we always have, that's why we have this button, which is always accessible. Uh, and uh, that the, the user can withdraw the consent at any time. So, I mean, that is a key functionality that should be there. And um, uh, that's it. I mean, basically, we, what we do is we, if, 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 it, if it isn't somebody who's, that, you, that you trust, that the publisher trusts, like they've not signed up for the, the uh, vendor list or the IOB program or whatever, then we can just block them. They can be blocked if the user doesn't give consent. And also, this is a, it's a kind of a, uh, a, a whitelist approach, i.e. if they're not on the list, they get, get blocked. So you can, it's a way for the publisher to ensure that there's nobody appearing on their site that they, they haven't got an agreement with, which I think is quite important. Okay, thanks. I think, Alain, you want to say something to this? Well, uh, I can uh, just <laughs> basically copy what, what was said before. I can maybe also go into um, maybe it was also into the direction of uh, in web you can actually share the content so you can um, actually share a CMP wide or publisher wide um, content which is in app currently at least not working without a well bigger back end version of that which um, I have personally legally issues how to actually implement that so a content within an app currently actually stays within an app and is not easily transferable to something else due to technical limitations of uh, well the the mobile OSs from Google and from uh, Apple. Okay, thanks. And um, was there anything from uh, from Blake? You want to say something? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll repeat a little bit, but our solution as well has a very configurable way for you to determine if you want to embed a link at the bottom of your page. Do you want a button added to float on the site throughout the entire experience? Do you want it in the header? Do you want it on your cookie policy page? We give you a JavaScript tag uh, to do that um, in your mobile applications. If you're talking about native mobile applications, we have a consent preference center that you can embed into it um, and various things like that. So multiple options for how you as a publisher or you as a customer of ours would want to surface allowing the user to manage their preferences post that initial web visit. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for the answers, guys. Um, question came in from Sean Doherty. He asks, as a mobile SDK publisher, would the expectation be to listen to the consent given by the parent app or for the SDK to initiate the UI for consent collection? And what information would we need to give a parent app to use this framework to gather consent and add us as a vendor of the data? Would you be able to answer that, Alan? Um, could, could you maybe copy and paste that to me so I can read it? Um, yeah, sure. In... <laughs> yeah, it's quite a long question. It's actually two questions. <laughs> Hit uh -huh. um, so I, I just sent it to you through the chat. Um, so uh, first one. So <clears throat> as as we or the the API that is defined basically defines one place where everything is stored. Any SDK that is out there can go there without any well being dependent on on an upstream or a different SDK. So it really one storage place where everybody can just go and pick this information up and of course needs to act accordingly. Um, so there is no dependency for, I don't know, Smarto having a mediation partner, then actually Smarto handing it over to the API of that mediation partner as long as they are able to read these parameters out. Um, what information would we need to give a parent app to use this framework to gather content and add us as a vendor of the data? So you don't need to give direct information to the parent app. The publisher, of course, needs to whitelist you, as was stated before. So you need to be able to appear on the list where content is given. If you're not on that list, 
concept will never be asked for you. So um, I guess many people are now reaching out and saying, dear publisher, um, please add these following companies to your opt-in list. Okay, thanks a lot, Alan. And I think there's um, one more question that came out. Um, we don't really have time for more than that. So I'm going to ask this question from Roy Smith, who asks, in the mobile specification, when there are several apps running on a device, how do does the second, the third, etc. app access the user's consent um, stored in the first app storage? Um, so basically what he asks is, wouldn't each app have to get its own consent for advertising? So yes, um, each app sadly needs to get its own consent. Um, there are barriers of the operating system that can't be overcome. Um, there is a way in, in Apple iOS, I think, um, to share this basically within a publisher. But there is no way within that device to share it from A to B. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, so I'll do one more question since we have one more minute. Um, Kevin Hartleben asks, I believe Baycloud uh, specified site siloed consent. Is web, is web wide consent supported? And can OneTrust specify their web versus site wide consent capabilities? Yeah, we, uh, we support, uh, well, we, we support, we're, we're pushing primarily the, the, uh, the site specific consent, but we have an option because the, the Do Not Track protocol had a, a web-wide consent option in the API as well as a site-specific option. But our position really has been that it's pr probably a lot easier to get a user to agree to a site-specific consent than it will be to say, you know, web-wide where they could be being tracked all over the web. Um, but we do support both options in the, in the, in the, site, in the non-site-specific case, we would support the, uh, the single domain you know, cookie EU consent in the in the uh, consentsu.org domain, sort of, sort of domain of it. Yeah, and on the OneTrust side, uh, similar in terms of we support both. We let you decide the scope of your consent, and if you want that to be site specific or site wide. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for joining me today uh, on the panel, and thanks everyone for dialing in. Uh, this is going to be the end of today's session. Um, as always, we try to send a follow-up email uh, on Monday after. Um, you should receive that at some point on Monday uh, for me. It'll have maybe the slides, if I can get them from Alain's presentation, and some useful links uh, that were mentioned during the call. Uh, so with that, I wish all of you who are in Europe a good weekend, and happy Friday to those of you uh, in the US. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.